faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above this world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled for faith has caught the joyful sound the song of saints on higher ground lord lift me up and i shall stand by faith on heaven table land a higher plane than I have found Lord plant my feet on higher ground I want to scale the utmost height and catch a glimpse of glory bright but still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift us up and let us stand through faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than we have found. Lord, plant our feet on higher ground. Amen. Thank you, Brian. That was beautiful. Our scripture reading today is found in the book of Luke, verse 13, Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Our pastor, Evan Bugaker, has our service today. It's a blessing to be here with uh, each one of you today. Um, before we get into the message, um, there's something I want to mention. Uh, is that uh, who here's seen the front of the church recently? Or ask, you've seen the front of the church. What's different about it? <laughs> New bushes. There were um, a few, few kind gentlemen who actually uh, took time out of their evening. And they, uh, they planted five uh, bushes out there. They dug the holes and uh, put in uh, Nellie Stevens hollies. And uh, they look beautiful out there. So um, it, it really looks nice. Uh, thank you to everyone who made the suggestions about doing it, um, the work that was done for it. And um, I think God uh, probably appreciates how it looks too, uh, that it makes his house uh, look a, a little bit better than it did. So um, let's pray and uh, get into God's word. Uh, dear Father in heaven, I'd like to thank you that, um, uh, that you've given us this time to know you just uh, that much better, Lord. Uh, put in our hearts a, a keen and strong desire to seek you and uh, love you and uh, we ask that this message uh, touch our hearts and inspire us toward heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, stewardship, uh, money, investments. Um, I believe God wants us to be uh, wise investors. And 
uh, you know, God, is, God has created all things. And uh, I'm curious, has anyone here uh, ever been involved in investment or anything like that? Investing? Okay. Um, you know that it's important to, to, to use wisdom while doing that. You know, you look at, um, you look at markets, you look at pros, you look at cons, and you put your money, you give your time, whatever you're investing, you put it where you think uh, there would be value and that you will see return on your investment. And uh, much like today, in Jesus' day, uh, money was an important thing. People wanted to know how to make money, to gain a livelihood, to increase their wealth, to have new homes. Uh, the, the latest, you know, I don't know what the latest technological developments were in Jesus' day, but their society was, it's better than we might picture. Um, th there were some, some good things in society then. The Romans had um, good water systems, uh, for sewage and, and all that kind of stuff, uh, good building uh, processes. But uh, people were interested in progress, making money, and unfortunately, with the growth and increase that comes with business and making money, is that uh, dangerous lust, that dangerous desire for more gain, more and unlawful gain, just to accumulate and to amass and to even take advantage of other people for one's own gain. The devil tempts us with those things. And today we're going to look at a, uh, a story in the book of Luke uh, related to all of this. Let's go to Luke chapter 16. We're going to talk about a wise investment. Luke 16. Luke 16. Luke 16, in verse 1, Jesus speaks to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, What's this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be a steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I've resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, that they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and just write 50. Uh, a steward is someone who, who looks after the goods, property, assets, the things of another person. The steward was appointed to look after his master's goods, accounts, and his money. And it had come to the master, the Lord's attention, that this steward, this person who was working for him, was wasting his goods, um, possibly even stealing from him. Somehow the accounts were not adding up. There, was, um, there wasn't proper accounting done. Things were being wasted. The master, the Lord, uh, has it brought to his attention, so he calls the, the steward over to himself saying, uh, I, I want to hear uh, what you're doing with what I've appointed to you. And so the steward, you know, he, he has that internal dialogue. He says, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? He knows his goods are being wasted. What am I going to do? He says, he's going to take it away from me. I can't dig. I, I don't want to work. Um, you know, when someone's used to stealing or wasting things, they, they don't want to work when they get money the unlawful, what we might call easy way. Then he says, well, I have too much pride. I'm, I'm ashamed to beg and ask for money. So 
I have a plan. Here's what I'm going to do. And we see what he does. Um, he actually goes to people who have debt to his master. How much does the, uh, the first person owe his master? 100 measures of oil, right? And then he tells this person who owes 100 measures of oil, he tells him to write how much? Half. He gives him a deal. He says, look, just pay 50 and your account is clear. We're good, okay? So doing this, the, the steward is thinking, okay, I'm making some friends. He says, I'm going to give this guy a deal. He's going to feel a sense of personal debt towards me. And I'm going to get myself some security for when I lose the stewardship. Okay, so he goes in, uh, in verse 7. He says, how much do you owe to another person? He says, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write down how much? Eighty. Another deal. Not quite as good as, as 50, half, but it's still a deal, right? He's getting 20% uh, off. Take your bill and write 80. So in verse 8, the master commended the unjust steward, or commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. We have uh, the master actually telling the steward, saying, wow, you did a really good job in, in securing friendships, securing yourself uh, a way to live and get by when the stewardship's taken away. The Lord says to him, he, he's actually commending him. He's saying, good job. Uh, something I want to point out here, the Lord, in this case, is not representative of God. In many of Jesus' parables, illustrations, the Lord, the Master, is God. But in this case, this illustration, the, the Master, the Lord, is not God. Jesus has another thing in mind with this illustration. And he's highlighting the, the shrewdness, the perseverance, and the mental effort that this man put into securing his life and his livelihood and his investment. The steward was, was a shrewd, sharp man who put effort into accomplishing his goals. And the Lord of the steward commends him for that. And then Jesus says this in verse 8. Here's his point. The sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. That's a sad statement. In Jesus' day, the people that were more invested and interested in their own pursuits, in their own pursuits, earthly, worldly pursuits, they put their time, energy, effort, and everything into what they were trying to accomplish as opposed to the sons of light, those appointed with the eternal truth appointed by God, they were, they were lackluster in their work for God. The worldly people put them to shame in the amount of effort that they put into their ventures, investments, explorations, and things they were trying to accomplish. In verse 9, Jesus says, I say to you, Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least, just a little, is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is just a little, least, is unjust also in much, a great amount. Verse 11 says, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you haven't been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, riches. A wise 
investment is what God calls us to, a wise investment. Taking things into perspective, there's something we all know. And it is that eternal things are more valuable than earthly things. We know that, don't we? Like, logically, we know that. We know heaven, eternal life, living with Jesus, um, getting to travel the universe. We know it's more valuable than anything on this earth. But we don't act like that. We, we submit to the desires of the body or the demands of the world around us, comparing ourselves to our coworkers, church members, what other people may have. And then our attention shifts from heavenly things out looking into earthly things, and they become our focus. And we forget what is eternal. I believe God has provided all, given all, in Christ for us to excel in spiritual matters. That's what we're here for, friends, is to excel in spiritual matters. We can have some earthly goods, but our focus and attention should be invested in the wisest investment, most intelligent investment we can ever make. And that's in eternity. Um, let's go to uh, 1 Timothy. Let's go to 1 Timothy. First Timothy chapter six, verse 17. First Timothy six, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty or trust in uncertain riches. Special counsel from Paul to Timothy to us is that as we prosper materially, let's not trust in uncertain riches in this world. We know in the book of Revelation that when the loud cry of the last message to earth in Revelation 18, the people of this earth who are rich and have put their trust in riches, they will be tossing their gold, their silver, anything they find valuable materially to the moles and bats into the sea, out on the ground, it will lose its value when eternity comes into perspective at the end. And so Paul tells Timothy to uh, instruct the people, command those who are rich in the present age. I would say thus, us here in the United States, comparatively, all of us here are, are rich um, comparatively to the rest of the world. Those of us who are rich, let us not put our trust in the things that we own. Let us not seek after those things with all of our heart, but let us seek the kingdom of heaven with all of our heart. Verse 18 says, Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Now, wealth and riches are a blessing, and God tells us that when we've been entrusted with wealth, it's to give it and provide for those that don't have enough. He says, be ready to give, willing to share. Don't store up things on the earth. Store up for yourselves a good foundation for the time to come. What is that time to come? What is that time to come? Jesus' return, when all will be revealed. Store up for yourselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Let's go to Luke 14. Luke 14. One question we might ask ourselves is, okay, we're, we're convinced that heaven's a good investment, eternity's a good investment. What does it look like to invest in eternity? 
Well, one is to um, live out the life of Christ in us by his strength. Let's go to Luke 14 and verse 13. Here's what it looks like to invest in heavenly things. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Who is that? The poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. The poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. When you give a feast, when you're feeling generous and want to give and have a, a party for your friends, also invite those who might not have friends, who can't even get to the feast or the party. If you're lame and, and you can't walk, how are you going to get to the feast if you're invited? Friends? And the person inviting might even make provision for that lame person to get to the feast. It takes extra effort to actually get that person there. So there's investment, there's sacrifice on the part of the person inviting. Also, these people, the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, materially, they probably don't have much to give you back when you invite them to the feast, do they? I mean, it's nice to have them there. They can bring their presence, which is a, a gift. Life is a gift from God. But as far as business connections, but as far as um, progress in your own endeavors, they might not have much to offer. And so you're almost inviting them. I shouldn't say at a loss because eternally there's, there's gain, but from a worldly perspective, there's no point in inviting those people. But that's what's different about the kingdom of heaven, is that God takes sinful, selfish people and puts in them a heart to sacrifice. Verse 14 in Luke 14 says, And you will be blessed. Remember, there is a promise that comes with this. You will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid when? When are you going to get repaid? Resurrection of the just. So those good works done in the sight of God do not earn salvation. Let me make that clear. They don't earn salvation. But the Bible is also clear, though, that the more good works you do, you actually do receive more past eternal life as far as things you're entrusted with in the kingdom of heaven. Those works do not save you. Christ saves you. But those good things you do in Christ's strength, they actually, um, God promises this, is that they actually um, um, are earnings. They're investments on your part with what God's given you, and God actually does give you more in his kingdom for doing that, which is cool, right? I mean, it, it's nice. You work and you get paid. It makes sense. You're not getting paid with eternal life through your works, though. That's by Christ, and you're not earning your salvation. But you're getting paid extra through your good works. That's kind of cool, right? I mean, the, I like that, you know? It's like, okay, uh, you're not doing it to gain, but God is generous, and he does that for us. So, uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Isaiah 58. And I think this is where many of the Hebrews got off track, is they, they began to try to earn their salvation and actually um, claim merit for, for having life or being a servant of God. Let's go to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. Now, the Bible also indicates that we will have more stars in our crowns um, as we work for the Lord. Isaiah 58, verses 6 to 10. Isaiah 58, 6 to 10. Again, God highlights this. This is what it looks like to invest in eternal things, to make a wise investment. Isaiah 58, 6. Is this not the fast that I've chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free? and that you break every yoke. Isn't it to share your bread with the hungry, 
that you bring to your house the poor who were cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him. And not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. A wise investment means sacrifice, giving bread to the hungry, clothing the naked. And God promises that our darkness will be wiped away and our light will break forth as the morning. Like that, that beautiful light that comes up over the, the horizon in the morning. The beautiful colors, the purples, the oranges, the yellows, the reds. When, your li- when the light breaks forth over the horizon in the morning, God promises that we will get clarity, um, good perspective as we pour out ourselves to other people. Is anyone here have, feeling like they're in doubt and darkness sometimes, uncertainty about where life might be going? This is a beautiful promise in Christ, in, uh, in the scriptures here, the word of God. It's actually that as we look outside of ourselves, we gain certainty and clarity. And I had a a valuable experience uh, in my own life with this. Uh, When I wasn't sure that uh, what God wanted me to do in life, as I set my own worries about what to do aside, I set those things aside and I began to give and not worry about what I was going to do. As I began to give, my mind opened and I got clarity um, on, on God's calling on my life. And so I want to encourage anyone here, if you're feeling uncertain about anything in your life or what direction to go, try setting it aside and just opening your heart up to people and, and doing good in the ways that you can. And it, it has a way of clearing the mind up and uh, offering perspective. So that's just something from my, from my own experience. But uh, investing in heavenly things, back to that, Mark 16. Let's go to Mark 16. Mark 16. Mark 16. The Great Commission, Mark 16, verse 15. Jesus says, go into where? All the world. And preach what? The gospel, the good news to every creature. Go into all the world, everywhere, everywhere, and preach the good news. Uh, This is a heavenly investment. Um... Let's not get distracted from our mission with worldly and earthly pursuits. We have something great to offer the world, and that is the good news in Christ. Let's go to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 and verse 36. I like how God uh, reasons with us too. He doesn't just say, go and do this, but he actually touches our reason, logic, and good common sense and understanding when uh, making his pitch to us. In Mark 8, verse 36, it says, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Really, what good is it? So, so uh, you become as wealthy as, as Warren Buffett. You get billions of dollars, or maybe you have uh, $500,000, and you trample upon your morals, you trample upon your principles that have been taught to you by God, and you set those things aside just for worldly gain. It's not worth it, friends, because the investment that Christ has put into us is of infinite value. 
I mean, from a common sense perspective, his offer is much better. And somehow the enemy has tricked us into thinking what we can see, hear, taste, touch, and smell is better than what we can't see off in the future. We, we become uh, forgetful of eternal things, things that are, have been promised. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 34. Those that have invested wisely, uh, this is what the sons of light will hear. Matthew 25, verse 34. When the end comes, the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. All right? So this is the fulfillment of the promise. Say, come, inherit the kingdom. Look at these next few verses. Verse 35, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. This is similar to Isaiah 58. Taking care of those who, who need help. I heard a wonderful testimony today in the praise and prayer time of, of some people uh, visiting um, our friend Kenneth over in, uh, in Siler City. This is the type of work that God is calling us to do. Those are the things that bring us together. I'm sure those of, those of you that went over to see Kenneth you felt, you felt a sense of camaraderie with one another, working together to, to brighten someone's day. That is the great work that, uh, that God has appointed us. You know, any difficulties or disagreements or any, uh, anything that's burdening us actually begins to dissipate as we work together to serve those outside of ourselves. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. And as we, we work together for a mission, a common good, and see accomplishment in that, we can see the Holy Spirit binding us together in moving forward and improving people's lives. Like Kenneth over in Siler City. Those are the types of things that God is asking us to do in his name. And uh, that's what it looks like to make a heavenly investment. Clothing the naked visiting the sick, going to those in prison, giving drink to the thirsty, feeding the hungry. This is a heavenly investment. Might seem like it's our own loss of time and food or clothes or money, but it's not, friends. God owns everything. He's going to restore it to you one day, and he's not only going to restore what you've given in this life, but he's going to double, triple, maybe even more of what you've given here. There is no limit to God's generosity and kindness. Let's go back to Luke 16. Luke 16. Luke 16, we have the unjust steward putting all of his mental effort into securing his earthly life. Let's take a lesson from that, but let's give everything we have to securing our heavenly life in Christ. What are we stewards of? We are stewards of the good news of the gospel. Good news of the good news. <laughs> We're stewards of the good news, friends. Let's share it. We, we know that from the parable of the talents that when you, when you put your talents to work, when you take the good news and sow it, that it multiplies. Sowing seed and giving multiplies that which is invested and in sown. So let's go over to uh, verse 8 again and take a look at this. 
Luke 16, verse 8, says the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Okay? I don't want that to be me, friends. We have a king who can multiply our efforts. Verse 10 says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful in much. He who is unjust in least is unjust also in much. Um, I just, sometimes I'm amazed how we're blinded to the eternal realities and we forget it. But um, let's consider one another, uh, together with one another, friends, that uh, God has made us a better offer than the devil. Let's not be deceived that what we can see in the present moment, what might look tantalizing, let's not be deceived that that's more valuable than heaven. And let's look past those things and actually look toward heaven. We can't, we can't focus on what we don't want.